Welcome to the Plant Free MD podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code ANTHONY to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, guys. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee, and I have with me a very special guest uh, today, Nina Teicholtz, who is an investigative science, uh, science journalist and author of the New York Times bestselling, um, bestseller, The Big Fat Surprise, uh, which upended the conventional wisdom of dietary fat, especially saturated fat, and spurred a new conversation about where these fats, in fact, cause or, or whether or not these fats actually cause heart disease. She's also a founder of the Nutrition Coalition, which is a nonprofit that works to ensure that nutrition policies are transparent and evidence-based. Um, and the work um, and her work involved in this is, has also uh, allowed her to testify in front of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, as well as the uh, Canadian Senate. She's also a graduate of Stanford and Oxford Universities and previously served as Associate Director of the Center for Globalization and Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Uh, Nina, thank you so much for, for coming on and taking the time to speak with me. Thank you, Anthony, for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. So, um, you know, obviously, you know, that, that's a quick sort of rundown on, on your background, but if you could tell us uh, just a bit about, you know, more about your background and, uh, and what you're doing now, uh, uh, so people can get to know you a bit more if they haven't uh, come across you before. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a, uh, so my background is as a journalist, and um, actually I was a vegetarian for more than 20 years when I started my work uh, in nutrition. And I, I got started because I had been assigned an article by a magazine to look into trans fats at the time. I knew nothing really about nutrition. This is in the early 2000s. Um, even though, you know, in retrospect, I think, you know, I had most of my life struggled with my weight and not felt particularly healthy, but, uh, but I approached it really as a journalist looking skeptically at everything that I came across. And I quickly discovered that there was this rich world of research uh, about dietary fat, which I had been taught and is still people really still obsess about this idea, you know, what is good fat, bad fat, how much fat is fat fattening is the fat in meat and cheese going to give you a heart attack. And there was a great deal of strange conflicting research and when I would call up researchers academics at university to try to find out what more about their work, I literally felt sometimes like I was interviewing or I was investigating the mob. I mean, in the sense that people would hang up on me, people were terrified to talk to me. I found researchers who would say, you know, I can't talk about that study. I can't talk about the low fat diet. So as a journalist, I thought, wow, there, there has to be a story here. Um, and that sent me down a rabbit hole. Um, I think many of your listeners um, and viewers will understand what it's like to feel obsessed about a subject, especially this subject, which is so rich and broad. And I read, you know, thousands and thousands of studies. I interviewed hundreds of nutrition scientists around the world and spent nearly a decade writing my book, uh, The Big Fat Surprise, which really did two things. The first thing it did was it brought together all the evidence in the various strains and different arguments for why we had gotten it wrong on saturated fats, right? Where did that idea come from? Who proposed it? How was it? How was it that we came to believe that saturated fat and cholesterol was the most potent way to cause a heart attack? And so I traced that whole story throughout history, really going back to the 1950s and, and our, 
created the argumentation showing that it really had not been ever proven to be true that idea and um and subsequently i followed up on that science and and you know there are now we can talk about what's happened now in the science but it's largely vindicated the, the kind of line of uh, argumentation that I make, was making, um, which, you know, at the time was very controversial. It remains controversial. But um, so, and I also in, in my book, I talk about, um, it was really the first time where that, uh, that somebody had put forward all the history of vegetable oils, also known people know them now as seed oils more accurately, but you know, where did they come from? How did we end up with uh, a product that had originally been invented to uh, lubricate machinery in the Industrial Revolution, how did we come around to the idea that that was the healthiest fat um, to avoid heart disease? So I talk about that in my book, and um, there's also a chapter on the Mediterranean diet, and which focuses on olive oil, but overall the Mediterranean diet, which many people think is the best diet for health. And so we could talk about that if you like, but that really plunged me into this world of nutrition science that I have remained in ever since. Um, and then I started the Nutrition Coalition, which is a nonprofit group to try to ensure that our nutrition policies actually reflect the science, that the process that produces them is rigorous and transparent. And I did that because it was so clear to me after reading these thousands of studies that those that all of that information was not in our guidelines had never been reviewed huge the most important most expensive studies that had ever been conducted. Funded by governments around the world had actually never been included in the evidence base for our dietary guidelines and so. Um, you know, our guidelines are incredibly powerful, even though we don't really know about them or think that they affect us, but they are very powerful in determining what we think is a healthy diet and what's fed in all kinds of public settings like schools. So, um, so I'm still working as a journalist and I'm still involved in the Nutrition Coalition and, uh, you know, have been working in this space now for um, more than a decade. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so I actually um, just signed up to to speak with a, a, a you know vegan nutritionist or you know proposed like you know specifically plant based and low fat, uh, low saturated fat diet. A guy named uh, Simon Hill, um, who's he was actually the first uh, person on the other side of the aisle who's ever agreed to like actually speak with me and, and sort of discuss these sorts of things. But and, and that's exactly what we're going to discuss. He says, you know, his main his main problem with eating meat is is because of saturated fat. And he just believes that saturated fat is just, you know, this horrible, horrible thing that's just terrible for you. And that's what he, you know, he was, I think he has a master's in nutrition. And that's what you know he was taught and um and what he espouses. And I think he's he's coming from an honest place. I just, you know, uh I think that um that but that's the the traditional teaching is that saturated fat is horrible for you. So where where does that where does that come from? And and you know am I in am I in for a rough time? You know, did I did I pick the wrong side in this uh, in this fight? Um, well, you might be in for a rough time because it's hard to talk about this science uh, when people are quite dug in, but I think you can be assured that the science is on your side. So let me just give a brief history of where this idea came from. Um, maybe, you know, your viewers already know this, but we can just briefly review. It comes from uh, a scientist named Ansel Keys who was um, was a professor at the University of Minnesota, and he was ex he came up with this idea that saturated fat and dietary cholesterol, so the kind of cholesterol you find in egg yolk shellfish, that those two um, nutrients in foods were they would cause your blood cholesterol to go up, and then that would clog your arteries uh, and ultimately give you a heart attack. That was called the diet heart hypothesis. And Ansel Keys proposed that in the 1950s. And he stepped into a situation of kind of a vacuum of information at that time, right? 
heart disease, which had been almost non-existent in the early 1900s, had risen by the mid-century to be the number one killer in America. And notably, in 1955, President Eisenhower has a heart attack in the Oval Office. And he uh, he's then, you know, not, he's, he's taken away from, he's, he has to go on bed rest for 10 whole days. The whole nation is transfixed and focused on this question like what is causing heart disease because at the time there was no accepted uh, cause that had been established and there were a number of competing hypotheses there was this idea that it might be the rising amount of auto exhaust that had come about from more cars um, on the roads it could have uh, people thought it was a, a re the result of vitamin deficiency um, people thought that it was the type A personality, somebody going around and screaming at everybody and then having a heart attack and dying. Those were all viable theories, but it was Ansel Keys through his basically his networking and his personal charisma and his ability to, as even his friends say, argue anybody to the, to the death, that he was able to promote his idea into a uh, importantly you know with leading doctors of the time including eisenhower's doctor but probably the most significant event was when he got onto the nutrition call sorry the nutrition committee of the american heart association so the american heart association was the most authoritative group then and probably one would say now telling people what to do about heart disease Ansel Keys was able to swing that group around in the course of a year um, based really on no data, but he was able to convince this group to endorse the diet heart hypothesis and tell everybody, well, at that time it was just men, tell men, 1961, avoid eating saturated fat, replace saturated fat in meat and eggs with polyunsaturated vegetable oils in order to avoid a heart attack. That is like the little kernel of advice that grew into this huge um, oak tree of, <laughs> of recommendations that we now have all over the world. And because that has been our advice for now 60 years, it's extremely hard to disentangle because it's really a kind of a very firm established dogma. Um, so, but just to continue that through line, what happened after 1961? Well, many governments around the world, including yours in Australia, they realized that although this recommendation had gone out, there really was no rigorous evidence for it, which is to say clinical trials, randomized controlled clinical trials, that is the only kind of evidence that can show cause and effect. So these governments undertook large, the really, some of the most ambitious, largest, longest clinical trials that have ever been done in nutrition in the 1960s and 70s. And these studies, uh, they, you know, they had, they, they were interpreted to imply that saturated fats did in fact cause heart disease. But if, and so that was sort of what was accepted um, for decades. But due to my work, the work of uh, journalist Gary Taubes, we went back and analyzed those trials and looked at them. You know, one of them had never been properly randomized. Another one had not controlled for smoking. Another one had let people wander in and out of their study and not really kept track of them. There, was a, there were studies that had been ignored where they showed they had to end the study early because people were dying. <laughs> people on the vegetable oil diet were, were dying. Um, so it turned out that these trials did not say what they were supposed to. So that's what came out in my book and in um, Gary Tabb's book, um, Good Calories, Bad Calories. And that was in the early, so, you know, that happened in like the 2000s, right? And so now, the last decade has really seen an kind of a real sea change in the science of saturated fat because scientists have been alerted to these clinical trials and they realize that they have been ignored, lost. Um, somehow we, we never paid attention to these studies in a rigorous way. So now there are at least 20 uh, papers that are, have 
done systematic reviews or meta-analyses they're called, but you know, really rigorous reviews of these clinical trials. And what have they concluded? They have concluded that the data do not support the diet heart hypothesis, which is to say the idea that saturated fat and dietary cholesterol cause heart disease is not supported by the evidence. Even though that idea has been tested, it's one of the most tested hypotheses in the history of nutrition science, but the results do not support that hypothesis. So, you know, when you really test a hypothesis at that level and it, and you, you get what's called null results, you have to just move on and say, okay, you know, we have to look at some other ideas. But just to emphasize how important this literature is from the last decade, these 20 review papers include a paper um, that I <clears throat> was somewhat involved in, which is by a group of authors that include four former members of the expert committees who actually wrote our US dietary guidelines. So these are people who are saying we wrote the guideline, but now we think that's wrong. We didn't know about this evidence. We've reconsidered it. And that paper was published by the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, which is a very prestigious, it's called a high impact journal read by cardiologists. It was called, it was um, branded as a state of the art review by the journal. It was selected by the editor in chief of that journal as one of the most important papers of the year that it came out. Um, I'm thinking it's maybe uh, 2019 now, but um, so that's an extremely important paper. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, what we have found is that the scientific community different groups of scientists from around the world, these 20 papers have really concluded that we got it wrong on saturated fats. And the challenge now is to get that science to rise up and be considered by our, our government agencies in charge of these guidelines. And there's just a lot of uh, resistance to that or stubbornness or difficulty kind of dealing with this change in our understanding on saturated fats and this new data. So we can talk about it that gets into the realm of politics, but in like in the scientific world, <laughs> there's really been a firm, a pretty firm understanding that saturated fats, uh, we just, we made a mistake on saturated fats. Yeah. Former editor in chief of the British Medical Journal, which is one of the oldest and most prestigious general journals in the world, Fiona Godley said at a conference, you know, I think we really have to, uh, we owe an apology to people. We just we we made a mistake on saturated fats. Yeah, and so so now with the sort of on the political side of things, is this is this more that there's just this this just weight of inertia behind this, and just so many people just have believed this that it's just hard to sort of change that around, or are there people really trying to stick to this uh, for one reason or another and trying to to keep that information away from people? Well, this is where we enter into the somewhat unsavory world of politics of yeah. nutrition, which is to say um, there are multiple agendas uh, that are that resist change. So we can just, um, you know, there 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 is, of course, kind of the the difficulty of bureaucracies being more or less sclerotic and mm -hmm. difficult to change, difficult to be seen as flip flopping on important issues with their public, because that is causes an erosion of trust. And there are there are hundreds of nutrition scientists who've devoted their entire careers to um, you know, to to this idea that saturated fats are bad, who are reluctant, understandably, to reverse uh, themselves on an entire published um, history, you know, intellectual history that they've that they've established their careers on. So there's that. There's also the fact that um, saturated fats tends to raise your LDL cholesterol. That's the so-called bad cholesterol. And that the biggest blockbuster drug of the history of the pharmaceutical industry has been statins and statins lower your LDL cholesterol. So there is a pharmaceutical investment in maintaining the LDL cholesterol model of heart disease. 
And under that model, saturated fats are bad for health, um, even though, as we've seen most recently in the, the Verda study out of the University of Indiana, that over the long, that's a five, they have five year data showing that the rise in LDL is transient and it, and it goes down over time. So, um, so there's a kind of a pharmaceutical investment in the saturated fat LDL cholesterol model. There's also the interest of the vegetable oil industry, which um, because remember vegetable oils, we've been told to eat these vegetable oils instead of saturated fats. So there's, and these are some of the largest companies in the world that have included Unilever, Bungie, ADM, Monsanto, and all the soybean growers who, uh, it's mainly soybean oil that people consume that are, whose products end up in these oils. Those are huge multinational companies who do not want to see, uh, you know, their market share decline in any way. I mean, they have seen in the US, at least, I'm sure there's a similar curve in Australia, but we, the, the, the biggest increase in any foodstuff over the 20th century has been vegetable oils. We went from eating virtually zero of them to now eight or 9% of all of our calories come from vegetable oils. Since 1970 in the US, we've increased them by 90% our consumption. So there's that interest, which is, you know, resistance to um, losing market share. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, there's, there are other interests. There are uh, there, the tremendous push towards veganism, um, which we see, which has many different financial and ethical and ideological movements behind it. For them, saturated fats, the limit on those fats is what keeps down consumption of animal foods, which is important to them because they feel like that's an unethical to eat those or it might be harming the environment from their perspective. So, I mean, that's just a snapshot of some of the interests involved um, in this. Yes. So it is, it is extremely hard to change, but I will say it's becoming harder and harder to resist the science. I mean, a, in a paper that I uh, was a co-author on, we, uh, we analyzed our own US dietary guidelines, the expert committee and their recent review on saturated fats for our 2020 guidelines, the most recent version. Their review, we can, we, I looked at all the studies that they had used for their review and it, it I found that like something between 70 and 100% of their studies, depending on what the outcomes were, did not support their conclusion. So the vast majority did not support the idea that saturated fats cause heart disease. And yet their conclusion was the evidence that saturated fats cause heart disease is strong. Yeah. Right, top level recommendation, all those 70 to 100% of the studies that they provided for that recommendation showed exactly the opposite from what they said. So, um, you know, so this is and this is an area that's a lot of interest pushing against any liberation of saturated fats and, uh, and the science is clearly not being heard. Yeah. I'm just going to point out one point because I, th I think that, you know, when you talk to um, this vegan guest, um, that the arguments that they that are often um, put forward and is that saturated fats cause inflammation, saturated fats um, have negative effects on cholesterol. But remember, these are all inflammation and cholesterol are what's called um, intermediary outcomes, right? They're important to measure, but they don't always predict heart attacks or death. And so it's really important to know that these large clinical trials that I talked about from the 1960s and 70s, they went long enough or in more powered in the means, in other words, they had enough people in them to look at heart attacks and death, right? Death is the ultimate outcome as we might call it in science because it's really important to know, maybe you are, are not having as many, maybe you're having more heart attacks, but what if it causes cancer instead, which is in fact what these trials found in some instances, which is that the people on the high vegetable oil diets were dying at higher rates of cancer. Mm -hmm. So you might be seeing some of these intermediary effects on inflammation and LDL cholesterol, but really 
when you have hard outcome data on heart attacks and death, that trumps any other data you might have. It might be that the data, this intermediary data was not quite correct or transitory as we found out with LDL cholesterol. So really it's the hard firm outcomes, what we call hard outcomes of heart attacks and death that were studied, we have data on, and they showed that saturated fats when replaced by vegetable oils do not uh, reduce cardiovascular events or reduce um, mortality. Right. And that's, um, and that's looking at the actual data, but then also the, the, right. these recommendations, like you're saying, you know, they, they, their own supportive evidence didn't actually support their conclusions, which is why I always, always right. tell people like, like never just read the conclusion, you know, because they can conclude whatever they want. Like I, I've read so many studies, you know, by the WHO and, and elsewhere that, you know, they come with some conclusion. I'm like, that doesn't sound right. You know, I, I remember seeing right. that when, when I was like, a, when I was like a kid, they said that like, you know, Cuba had a top five, one of the top five, um, uh, healthcare systems in the world. And like us was like 76, I'm like, there's no way. There's absolutely no way. And like, I read the study and it was, and it was, you know, they, you know, just fudged around with things. They basically, they, they, they calculated the, the, the health outcomes and the medical system as a, as a function of the, that country's GDP. And so, because, you know, we had a, a good healthcare system, but we had the best GDP, we were ranked lower than Cuba that had a horrible healthcare system, but an even worse GDP. And so it was just like, right. well, that's, that's complete garbage. Um, and so you unfortunately find these things. And, um, and that's one of the things too, uh, is that, uh, to my understanding, the, you know, the, those original guidelines and, you know, even Ansel Keys and, uh, and other professors actually turned out that they were, were being misleading on purpose. It wasn't that they got it wrong. It wasn't, it wasn't false. It was, it was fraudulent. Do you, did you look into that as well? Um, yes. I mean, there's, it's really important to understand for those of us who are coming into this field, I remember when I started and I had, my father is an engineer and, and also worked in computer science and was a professor at Stanford University. It was, I had so much respect for science and I thought it was this sober minded, ethical, slow moving kind of um, thoughtful profession where people would reflect upon the data. They would, <clears throat> if they saw, evidence to the contrary, they would consider it and reckon with it, maybe change their ideas. What I found was, at least in the field of nutrition, something completely different from that, which is, and I think this is, I've now come to understand that this is true in quite a, a number of fields where if there is a prevailing theory, like the diet heart hypothesis, and, and that's the theory that is embraced by your funders, you know, the, the government agency that provides money for scientific funding, there's tremendous pressure on scientists to conform with that. Because if they don't, they're not invited to conferences, their funding isn't renewed. I actually, you know, I talked to a professor from the University of Vanderbilt who had findings to the contrary. He had gone off to um, study a tribe in Africa and found out that they're they were eating meat and fat and, you know, by all accounts should have been dying of heart attacks um, right and left. And that in fact, when he took electrocardiograms of 600 of them, he could find maybe only one case of, of anybody having a heart attack. And so he was, you know, he came back and tried to present his findings and was at some point told by uh, somebody at the National Institutes of Health listen, if you continue with your opposition to Ansel Keys, you're going to lose your research funding. And in oh. fact, he did lose it. Wow. So there are many stories of scientists who find, who are unlike this professor I just described, who instead of speaking out, they, they change their data. So they do this in many ways. Um, they do it by not publishing their results. The largest ever study of the diet heart hypothesis, the Minnesota coronary survey, when they came out with the results, which showed that, in fact, that the people who the men and women who lowered their cholesterol the most had the highest rate of heart attacks, they they didn't publish their results for 17 years. 
uh, you know, which in science is, is sort of a form of lying because, you know, you're withholding data. It had been a, a study that had been funded by our National Institutes of Health. And, you know, when asked why, they were just said, well, we were so disappointed with the way it came out. Um, so there's a, there, you can just not publish data. There are instances where um, a colleague of Ansel Keys named Jerry Stamler, he did something called the US Railway Study. His results did not support the diet heart hypothesis, but he was so invested in the diet heart hypothesis that he presents his results. And as you say, in the conclusion, he says, well, we didn't find this, but we still think the diet heart hypothesis yeah. is correct. Yeah. And so, and misrepresents his findings. And, you know, this is what's so confusing to people who are new to the field. They just, they can't understand that this might go on, but it goes on all the time. I mean, it's, it was more common than not in the papers that I went through. Yeah. And that's, um, you know, and unfortunately that you know, we do see that in the sciences, you know, I know, uh, you know, people like to think that, that in the sciences, you know, you have someone who, who works for 30 years and, and, and stakes a reputation on, on a certain uh, hypothesis, and then someone disproves it and he goes up and shakes their hand and like, oh, I'm so happy you, you proved me wrong. Uh, I think that's happened once in history. You know, um, <laughs> you know when my, you know, my dad was actually at Berkeley, uh, you know, I mentioned that he was working with uh, Louis Alvarez on the, on the bubble chamber and, you know, um, studying subatomic particles. One of his professors, he, he went in um, into his office and the guy was just, just obviously had some soul crushing moment. And my dad asked me, he was like, you know, is, it, is everything okay? Uh, well, they, they just sort of discovered the attractive forces between protons and electrons. And, and they studied that again, you know, uh, um, you know, versus the gravitational forces. And they found that that, that attractive force, that, that pl those plasma forces, the negative and positive charges was uh, 10 to the 42nd, um, to the 42nd power times more powerful than gravity. And this guy was saying, he's like, I think I've wasted the last 20 years of my life. You know, <laughs> like gravity cannot be the answer. I mean, it, it, there's no way. This is 42 orders of magnitude times more powerful. Than, like it, it can't be gravity. And, and he actually completely revamped his, his research and went in a completely different, different uh, direction after that. So, you know, but that's like, that's like you know the one the one sort of uh, uh, example that I know of, and so yeah, it's it's unfortunate that people really do stake their reputations, and and then they just they just they cling to them, and you know, where I would think that you would I would I would have more trust in someone if they could just look at it and go like, damn it, yeah, you're right, that doesn't make sense that that you know what I was saying is true, and then go with it. You 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 you'd see that they had to have some integrity behind them, you know, because they, you know, not everyone can be right all the time. You just, it just can't happen, you know, and, and sorry, you're going to say. Yeah, no. And I think, you know, there's another factor here in this field that, you know, is sort of obvious to everyone, but there's a lot of money from the food industry that comes into play. And, uh, and so there's, it's more common than not that researchers are getting money from the food industry and and that just distorts i mean the food industry in the us they have they have been working at least since 1941 when they started a kind of uh nutrition association mainly a, you know which was basically large manufactured food companies you know the american biscuit company and um and 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 others who were were they they started to understand they've been at this and they've been at it for decades they started to understand how to influence science and the best way to do that is to do it and to do that at the very source right so you fund the scientists you fund their conferences you fund panels you fund at every level of the science you uh you influence it so that you know by the time the science is getting to be considered by experts who are making recommendations there's been money that has been invested at every point, and there's money then invested beyond anything that any science-minded group could spend. There's so much money that comes into the that comes in through lobbying of government agencies. So, um, so you know, the food and pharmaceutical industries are they they're deeply invested in our what we eat, what we're told to eat. Um, whether or not that makes us well or sick. The 
the, you know, as our economies have suffered in the last few years, I mean, the greatest growth industry in our countries, certainly in the US, is sickness. That is, if you go into any town in America where the life has been sucked out of the main street and the downtown and and what is a, the spanking new building in town is the dialysis center or um, the new cancer wing of a hospital. I mean, sickness is a huge growth industry. We spend like a billion dollars a day in our country just on diabetes alone. Jesus. So that's where the money is. Yeah. And, and that is, there's just no question that that influences our ability to do good science and have that science be heard in this, in this world of you know, nutrition and health. Yeah, that, that, was, that was one of the things too that I, that I wanted to get into this this sort of feel as well, because like, I actually want to, I want the opposite. Like I, I really want to put a lot of doctors out of business. Like that's, that's actually one of my yeah. main goals is, is to have, a, have them have a lot less to do, you know, because you know, we have, we all, all these people basically spinning our wheels, treating diseases that don't need to exist. You know, they, they shouldn't be there. You know, we're, we're, we're getting yeah. sick because we're eating stupid things. And this is causing basically a, a you know, poison, effect you know we're, we're eating poison we're getting poisoned and we're treating this as if it's a disease and we're making you know de novo drugs to, to mitigate you know the damage and have you die slowly over 40 years as opposed to just removing you know the stimulus in the first place and just and just getting rid of the problem um i think that we could get a lot of brain power and a lot of money pointed in in very different actually useful directions and, uh, and, and be much better off for it. And, you know, it sounds like, you know, putting people out of business or whatever, I'm happy with that. They can go and do something productive and I'll, I'll, I'll do the same, you know, like, I mean, I like trauma surgery. So, you know, I'm in, in, um, you know, neurosurgery and I actually really like trauma surgery. And so I think that'll, I think I'm, I'm okay on that end because there'll always be, you know, drunk idiots, but like, you know, that, uh, that need to get the, you know, half their skull taken off. But, you know, it's, um, I think that that's, that's what we need to get back to. We need to get back to actually treating problems as they arise and not, and not, not manufacturing them so that we can then treat them. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, my heart actually goes out to doctors because I think that they, you know, so many extremely smart people go to med medical school with the desire to help people, but the system that they enter, uh, which, you know, has largely, you know, has evolved to respond to pharmaceutical interests, teaches them that first of all nutrition and lifestyle are wimpy and don't do and aren't you know aren't part of the calculation um and and fair enough because the dietary advice we've been giving people and that they give people they find doesn't work and hasn't worked because it's not based on good science um you know they tell people go out and eat more fruits vegetables whole grains nuts seeds lean meats i mean and and that doesn't work and has been showed not to work in clinical trials so they don't have any faith in nutrition. And then they're taught to see every part of the body as its own different segmented systems. So if you have a headache, you get a pill for that. If you have acne, you get a pill for that. If you have uh, you know, irritable bowel syndrome, you get some kind of medication for that. But you know, if you have prediabetes or diabetes, you get insulin. But they're not taught to look at the body systemically they're not given the time to think about it and they're they have no under they're not taught that all of these different symptoms are in fact connected to the body's inability to uh to deal with the amount of uh sugars and starches that are coming into their you know their systems causing hyperinsulinemia, excessive insulin in the body chronic excessive insulin the inability for the the energy centers of the cells to function because they're not getting the right fuel. So all of that is not talk to doctors. They don't have the tools to help people. So I feel sorry. You know, I actually feel badly that we have this, we have a system that is not helping people and the doctors are, you know, they really become cogs in, at least in the U S they, they, they aren't really allowed to be thinking people. They have to follow guidelines. They aren't given the leeway to 
make their own decisions and and you know they're just kind of administrators of drugs and devices so it's it's a you know very and that's why i think also there's so, so much burnt at, burnout in the profession yeah that and a few other things yeah <laughs> but well, it's um yeah. yeah i mean it like the whole structure this whole system has to change mm -hmm. and doctors are you know they are not the major players in that system in terms of making decisions, unfortunately. No, and uh, and yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I think it's it's very easy to burn out. And I, I've spoken to doctors about this who've, who've changed around. Um, you know, a friend of mine, um, you know, uh, Dr. Pran Yukanathan uh, over in um, Sydney. You know, he's a, he's a gastroenterologist and a hepatologist, and he uh, you know just came across this like you know the things that I'm doing aren't really helping people and he found that like you know diet and lifestyle changes actually help people a lot more and he actually took quite a pay cut because he was you know if he's doing procedures and he's doing you know colonoscopies and all these sorts of things he gets he gets paid more for that whereas like you know giving them nutritional advice and and, and bouncing them over to uh, you know a dietitian in his practice he gets paid much less for that but it actually helps people and so he you know, uh, is, is much more satisfied with that, which is, which is good. I think most doctors would, would find that, that, uh, you know, and some people are, are just, you know, you know, there's, there's always, you know, the people out there that are just sort of, you know, in it for the wrong reasons, but I think a lot of people are in it for the right reasons. And when you're just seeing that you just sure of just spinning your wheels and it's just not really making much of a difference that that can be, then that can be difficult. Um, yeah. Uh, I remember meeting a doctor when I was down under um, mm -hmm. there who who had retired when he discovered the uh, uh, the whole science of of insulin and and sugar and 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 he really started to understand this systemic thinking about the 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 body and he he was so mortified that all the advice he had been giving to people his entire career had actually been harming them in his view and and he had not been helping people he was so devastated by this it was like almost this it was really a, a, a like a, a tragedy for him and he spent he was telling me he spent all of his time in retirement traveling wherever he could in any setting to talk give talks to people free of charge as really as almost a penance that mm. he felt he had to carry out in order to be right uh in his own soul you know but um and to teach people and to about you know what he had discovered about um real science and health and so you know i, I and i also i'm sure you know stories i know so many stories where people are on the verge doctors are on the verge of quitting they find out about this science and they uh they're you know just revolutionizes they're on you know they they literally like take back the retirement paper to be able to practice and heal people which was always their original intention but it had just been impossible in in the in the healthcare system as we as we have it yeah. so um yeah it's i mean i i think it's yeah it's a bit it's a bit of a a tragedy, but I, I think there's you know also hope in the sense that there is there's so much research coming out now in this area in so many different areas that you would you would never imagine. There are people studying the effects of a carbohydrate restriction, healthy proteins on acne. There are people studying it on um, polyuricystic uh, syndrome. I think I'm mm. pronouncing that wrong. But POCS on um, you know, on fatty liver disease and all these different conditions. And these are fields that are maybe a little bit less locked into paradigms um, that they have been in because they, they haven't really considered nutrition in these fields. They didn't even think nutrition could affect their these conditions. So, um, but we're seeing, you know, in mental health, there's like really interesting advances now that are happening. And there are, so there's, I think in the world of science, there's, and, and in medical care in some communities of doctors, there really has been a lot of uh, progress and change. So, um, you know, I'm not without hope that there that there will be um, that this paradigm shift that we're experiencing will continue. Yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are about that, but curious to hear. No, I, I, cer I certainly think so. And I think 
probably in the next, I think, I think it's, 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 it had to start grassroots, right? It wasn't going to come top down. And so, you know, enough people had to, had to become, you know, made aware of this and enough people had like yourself had to speak out and, and really, really dig into the data and then, you know, publish it and, and write books on it and do talks and, and then have discussions on YouTube and things like that. And, and then just get this out um, by word of mouth. But now I think it's, it's gotten to the point where, you know, it's getting, it's garnered enough attention that you can actually can start doing TV shows or, or, um, you know, documentaries and things like that. I know you were on, um, uh, with, uh, you know, Vinny, uh, Tortorich, um, and the, um, Fata documentary and the beyond impossible sort of things as well. And that, and that's, I think those sorts of things are, are huge and, and just making this, making our way into the mainstream. Um, I think it has done that. I, I speak to a lot of doctors, you know, that I just come across and, and they're very, very receptive, you know, to what I have to say. And a lot of them just will just come up to me randomly and just say, Hey, are you that guy that you just only eat meat? Right. And you're like, yeah, yeah. And they'll just ask me about it. And we'll talk about it. And you know, I have a lot of doctors in my, in my department that are now, you know, fully, fully meat based, like just, just carnivore altogether and others and everyone else is just, you know, increased their intake of meat dramatically. And, um, and, and which is great. And, uh, and so you, you start seeing this and then, you know, talking about, you know, like, you know, cholesterol and heart disease. And you know, a lot of people are like, yeah, you know, I never bought that in the first place. You know, they just, that just seemed like, like rubbish to me. And, and so, and, and now they're just being a bit more free to talk about it. Um, when I first moved to Australia, it was like, I was just, I had like five heads people like, you do what? You know, because the, the vegan uh, movement here was so strong. And, uh, and, you know, when you talk about like the, the regulations and people just sort of regurgitating guidelines in America, it's even, even worse in Australia because the regulatory body here, APRA is, is very, very vigilant. And if you get on the wrong side of them, they, they will make you pay for it. And so, you know, people really have to toe that line, uh, or, or, you know, risk, risk the wrath of, uh, of, uh, the, the, the licensing body. So people are quite worried about that. But when I first got here, like no one had heard of this. No one had, had even considered like an all meat diet. And so I got, I was talking about it quite a lot because people were just like, just shocked by, by what I was doing. And, but now, you know, I talk to people and I'm, you know, sort of having, you know, lunch at the hospital and I just have like a pile of eggs and bacon. And uh, someone asked me like, oh, well, you know, like, well, that's a, that's a lot of meat. That's a lot of eggs. You try and get your protein up. I was like, well, I just don't need anything else. And they're like, oh yeah, you know, are you doing a carnivore diet? And I was like, yeah. It's like, oh yeah, my, my brother's doing that. Like he lost a bunch of weight and like really likes it and all that sort of stuff. So now people actually know about it and they know about it by name. And, uh, and now, you know, people have to go on uh, different platforms and, and talk trash about it and have to say like, oh, this is really bad. This isn't sustainable for these reasons. But, you know, Two years ago, it wasn't even on the radar. It wasn't big enough for them to even, you know, uh, speak disparagingly of it because it just, just, you know, wasn't uh, wasn't popular enough. So now I think that, you know, that is starting to turn the corner. People are starting to wake up, and they are starting to, you know, look at your work and and people like you's work. They're showing up like this. This was this was based in nonsense, and this isn't actually what what the studies show. And then they try it for themselves and go, my God, I just feel so much better. And they're reversing their issues. They're reversing their, uh, you know, weight gain and diabetes. And, and, you know, a lot of people are, you know, actually, you know, uh, treating cancer this way. You know, I, I spoke with a professor from Boston College, um, Thomas Seafried. You know, he's, he's like pumped us over like 150 peer-reviewed, um, you know, journal articles and studies uh, on this subject. And he's just really showing, he's just like, look, if you know cancer biology, you realize that, you know, if you have healthy mitochondria, you cannot get cancer. And if you are, if you do have cancer, the last thing you want to be doing is eating carbohydrates because they require 400 times the amount of glucose to run as, as do our, or other cells, and they cannot run on ketones. And so if you're in ketosis and you have low blood sugar, you know, you're starving out your, your cancer cells. So this is just a no brainer in his, in his mind. And, and so I think that it, it is coming to the forefront. And I think I'm hopeful that in the next sort of five years, this is going to be a more of a mainstream um, notion that like, you know, that, that diet is, is a really a major, major factor in our health and not the way that we've ever been told it was. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I just basically agree with you on everything that you're saying and, and it's, um, 
I, I think you know, there really is this, on the one hand, this growing body of science and clinicians and people who are finding unprecedented levels of success uh, with this approach. And then there are, there's a huge um, mammoth group of moneyed interests who are against health or are pro vegan due to you know, environmental factors. And, and this is, you know, this is the kind of the clash that we're seeing out there. I think that most people think, well, it won't affect me because I will just be able to do what I want. And, you know, I can eat the way that I, uh, that I need to for, for me, for my family. Um, but one of the reasons I started the nutrition coalition, and I, I, I believe this is true, um, really for everyone is that we now live in an environment where um, we've long lived in an environment where our government policies really control what's going on for children in schools, elderly people in um, nursing homes or people receiving food um, through assistance programs, and that these guidelines, because they're these national guidelines, because they're considered the gold standard, are also downloaded for all the cafeteria food, basically food in any institutional setting. Um, and as you you know, indicated that if you're a healthcare practitioner, doctor, dietitian, nutritionist, any of these people who are teaching about nutrition, you can get in trouble for not teaching the gold standard. You or you can't get a job or you. Uh, so, I mean, there are ways in which our lives are really controlled and affected by these guidelines. We in the US can't, con we, we can't constitute uh, a military force, we have failed on recruiting goals because in large part, so many people are obese and just can't meet the fitness criteria. Mm -hmm. So it affects our military preparedness. <laughs> and now there's a new set of threats to our food supply that are coming um, through, basically through the United, efforts at the kind of the United Nations level, but that are, are kind of trickling down to various governments whereby they want to um, <clears throat> reduce or eliminate the amount of meat that we can eat. Um, they're buying crop, they're buying ranches and taking them out of production so that people cannot no longer raise cattle or, or, or pigs. They are, um, they're levying taxes on meat um, or proposing them. They're um, not allowing advertising for meat um, to try there. <clears throat> there's, there's just many, many, many different efforts to try to reduce the availability of, of meat and um, particularly beef. And that affects us because, you know, when I go to the supermarket, I mean, I, there's, <clears throat> I mean, I went to the supermarket the other day, I live in New York city and a steak this big was $20. I don't know what that is in Australian currency, but that's yeah. that's expensive. That is really out of the range of the average um, the average American budget. Yeah. So all of this that's happening on a on a political level, nationally, internationally, that does affect us. Even though we might, you know, we are, we're trying so hard just to carve out a little world that makes sense to us and where we can feel metabolically well, but um, this other, you know, what's happening politically globally is, is still, it just has to be of concern to us, I think. Yeah. And, and why do you think that is? Why is there this huge attack on meat and, and beef in particular? Well, again, it's like, where do you start? But I mean, <laughs> there's, there's definitely the very strong, um, and powerful group of people who believe that cattle is the is the single most important thing you can do for climate change. I don't think we have the time to get into those claims, but I will say one really important fact about that, which is that there has never been a conference where uh, various sides of that issue, people arguing for, you know, about how cattle may ne not necessarily be a cause of climate change due to many, many com studies that show otherwise or, or conflicting, uh, or people representing the 
the view that meat is nutritionally important, vitally nutritionally important for many populations, or the people arguing about the economic importance of livestock for many people's livelihoods, none of those views have ever been presented in a conference. So what we have is a viewpoint that has never been discussed and debated scientifically. That has taken off, right? That has like, it's become accepted wisdom without any debate. That's not the way it's supposed to work. So there's the, the climate change forces, there's the animal rights views, which are very well funded. Many people feel very passionately about that. Um, you know, why eat animals um, we, <clears throat> when we're a civilized race of people? And again, people do not talk about the nutritional importance of meat. You know, where are you going to get your iron, folate, B vitamins? Where are you going to, your, your source of a complete protein, where are you going to get that if you remove animals? Um, you, you, you can't. Um, so, um, and then there is this huge gale wind of financial interests that have grown up around the fake food industry, trying to replace every kind, not just meat, everything, fake eggs, fake milk, fake um, chicken, everything that they're trying to create fake products. Those products are you know, the, the, the profit in the food industry comes from processing, right? You're talking about highly processed foods, huge profit margins, a lot of uh, investment payback on these, even if they fail, there's just these bubbles that are created that create, that generate huge amounts of wealth. So, and, and these are not small companies. They're sort of, there's just enormous investment in all of these companies and they're seen as a like one of the most promising new sectors of the food economy. So, I mean, those are just some of the forces um, that are behind this um, push towards veganism, but they're, you know, they're, they're incredibly well-funded and very powerful and have the ear of, of influencers at every level. Yeah. Well, that's unfortunate. Sure you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And um, so that, that um, you were saying also before, like vegetable oils, how these things, these came up. I mean, that, that, that's one of the arguments is that, you know, humans, yeah, I mean, since I was a kid, everyone, I, I was always taught that, you know, humans are apex predators, top of the food chain. That was very clear as far as the data was concerned. Uh, at least, you know, when I was growing up, that was what, that was, that was what people were, it wasn't even a discussion. You know, that was, that was just, this is, this is pretty straightforward. This is what the, the data shows. Now people are saying, well, no, not only is it unethical to eat meat, we actually never ate meat. We actually only ate plants and we're actually herbivores for all these different strange reasons. But even if you were to argue that, I don't see how anyone can argue that we like evolved on seed oils because those didn't exist. You know, those, ex those are a, a manufactured product, you know, but what, what, what's the, what's the story behind those? And, and, and what, you know, obviously you dug into the data you know, quite uh, thoroughly, what are, what are the health ramifications of seed oils? So seed oils, as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, conversation, they were, um, they, the, the original one was cotton seed oil that was made, pressed out of cotton seeds. They were a byproduct of the cotton crop in the, in the southern part of the United States. And that oil was used to lubricate machinery, which was important um, in the late uh, 1800s because whales, whale oil had been dependent upon heavily, but whales were being um, hunted nearly to extinction. So they needed a new source of oil. Here was cottonseed. And then various entrepreneurs looked at uh, this oil and thought, well, we can use it. It's cheap. Uh, we'll use it and sneak it into butter. Um, and and we'll you know see if we can and there was so there was adulterated butter that uh came into um into being in the late um uh, sort of the turn of the um 19th century so and then in uh there was a soap maker <laughs> and and a candle maker um there's proctor and gamble were these um two men who in 1911 they they introduced a product called Crisco. Well, Crisco was really the first human, uh, the first food product for human consumption 
that was made from these oils and it was it was they had these uh, Procter and Gamble had figured out how to harden the oil, which was critical because oils in their oil form are highly unstable they oxidize easily they go rancid. Um, so they had figured out how to harden it through a process called hydrogenation or partial hydrogenation. Which is a big industrial process involving involving a metal chelate and they made Crisco they marketed it in, with a huge amount of marketing dollars and this is what um, and convinced people that this was a safer and better than butter. Um, there's just a really fascinating history around this about how they were able to convince housewives, you know, they, you know, butter comes from slaughterhouses and is, or, you know, cattle are dirty um, and lard comes, you know, you have to kill animals to create lard and, but Crisco comes from a clean, shiny laboratory and, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a new thing. And of course, Americans were always into the new thing because we had come, people had emigrated to America to be in a new place and leave their grandmother's recipes behind. People wanted to assimilate. This was part of being the, the uh, an American, you know, then in the 1940s, there was a uh, further developments um, in chemistry labs where they figured out how to sell the oil as oil um, and they how to stabilize it in oil form. And all of a sudden we had Crisco oil and we had, you know, all different brands of oils that were touted as being good for cooking and frying, use them in your salads. Um, and a super interesting fact around this time was that Procter and Gamble really they they poured uh, a, a, like millions of dollars into the American Heart Association um, in the late 1940s, which I discovered through Procter and Gamble's own company history, a book you can't get anymore now <laughs> since I reported on it. Everything disappears from the from the internet the moment you publish something. And of course, Procter and Gamble went on to recommend these vegetable oils to prevent heart attacks. So, and and they still to this day get money and have a relationship with Procter and Gamble. Mm. But you know, so so then we saw the rise of vegetable oils because they were dubbed as being good for health. They lowered your cholesterol. They were better than saturated fats. Endorsed by the American Heart Association, and that that has seen this tremendous rise in the use of vegetable oils. But just briefly to go over like what are their health effects well that instability and oxidation turns out to be a big problem I mean you know I think all of us have heard of antioxidants why do we take antioxidants why do we think those were a good idea because oxidation is bad for human health it drives inflammation and these oils are they oxidize and what that means is they basically the the molecules um their bonds kind of open up and and bond with oxygen that's oxidation and then and this happens especially quickly if you leave an oil out in the sunlight or if they're heated remember you know your early chemistry experiments if you heated something that would speed up the reaction that happens when you heat oils uh so there's a huge literature that i um, sort of dug up and, and cover in my book about the problems of heating these vegetable oils and how they, they create these hundreds of oxidation pro products. Some of them are known toxins like acry acrolein, which is, um, you know, which is actually identified as a toxin. So aldehydes is another one, a known toxin that is known to, you know, to cause heart disease, to cause cancer. So, and those oxidize oxidative products they enter into the food supply that's been studied um, there are over 200 oxidation products that were found in a single piece of fried chicken from kentucky fried chicken and they've also been shown to pass through the blood brain barrier they get into your brain so there is really uh, they, they they hang out in every cell membrane, which is you know, your membrane of your cell controls what goes in and out. And if you have them in your cell membranes, your cells are not as um, intelligent um, as they should be. So they are, you know, heat, especially when heated, they are very unstable and dangerous um, products for human health. And just one other finding which I mentioned earlier, which is that in those large clinical trials where they 
had half, you know, one group on the high saturated fat diet, the other group was having a high vegetable oil diet. And those studies in, in five or six of those studies, they had what they call the inconvenient finding that the people on the high vegetable oil diet were dying at higher rates from cancer. Yeah. They were so concerned about that finding that there were three or four um, high level meetings at the National Institutes of Health where they gathered everybody together to try to figure out what to do about this finding. And they could never, they couldn't figure it out. And they, you know, there was just basically these inconclusive reports. And they said, well, we still believe we should tell people to reduce saturated fats, replace them with vegetable oils, because that's so important for our public health message. Yeah. So those findings have never been explained. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that the story of seed oils uh, is starting to get more publicity, but it's, um, you know, it remains, like, it remains something. And I think in the community of people who understand about sugars and starches, there's, you know, there's a lot of information also about seed oils, so people understand that. But, um, but you know, this, this, all of this story and this history and these health effects are, I think, are not yet really understood um, in the mainstream scientific communities. Yeah, yeah, but, like, yeah, yeah. Well, it's 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 funny too because you know the, these things just don't get discussed. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when I was in medical school, yeah. none of this gets discussed. It, right. and, and the thing is too is that you know people say, well, oh, well, well, doctors aren't aren't you know really taught all this stuff. We are not taught anything. At all. I mean, you have to take biochemistry. Yeah. You know, that, that's that's a prerequisite. So you actually do have to sort of understand, you know, and that, that that's really what nutrition is. You know, it's nutritional biochemistry. That's that's how these these molecules work in our body and our energy uh, systems. Uh, if you think about it in the correct way, that's that's that is what it is, and and you can you can actually glean a lot of information from that. Um, and um, but you know, in medical school, you really not taught anything. And, and, and really what it is, is just basically all your preconceived notions just get solidified because now I'm a health expert. I'm a, I'm a medical expert and I, I know all about health and whatever you thought was true. Now that that's now, now I'm a doctor. I can say that we're not taught any of this stuff. So it's not like, you know, we're taught that, you know, yeah. like sometimes you'll, you'll you know, I mentioned, you know, cholesterol something like that, but I, it's very, very limited. Um, but um, I, I know that you um, you have to go soon. I, I want to be respectful of your time, but um, you know one of the things that that maybe just as a last question, you know, uh, the answer to sort of the response that you, you would call, commonly get is like, well, what about the Eat Lancet trial and the Blue Zone studies and the, you know the China studies and these sorts of things? You know, what about those? Don't those show that you know plant based diet is really the best? Right. Well, it's not a small question. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so the China study never peer reviewed. Never, mm. it came, it did not come out in, in the peer, it came out in a supplement of a journal. It was never subject to peer review. It's also um, a, uh, it's a population study. Sorry. Sorry, go. That's no. strange. Yeah. So it's also a study that shows association, not causation, a very weak form of evidence. Um, the Blue Zones, a uh, cherry-picked group of um, of communities that you can, I mean, the short answer is you can also find plenty of communities that are long-lived that had very different diets, had high diets, very high in animal foods, like there, and so there's a, there's a tremendous range out there, and um, the Blue Zones are, are, you know, are not unique. I'm in the sense that there are other long lived populations. Also, in the blue zones, um, there's, you know, there's so many other things going on. They're all populations where people are, they have tight knit communities, they are connected to their traditions, they have they all kind they do all kinds of other things that contribute to long life. And do we know that it's diet? We don't know. Do we even know the diet is accurately measured? In the one blue zone that I investigated uh, for my book, which was the one on Crete, it turns out that that whole story is based on data on 30 to 33 men. Uh, and one of the sample periods was during Lent when there was <laughs> no animal foods being eaten. So how good is that data? You know, not very good. Yeah. Um, and that's just the one that I happened to investigate. You know, Okinawa is another one. I mean, 
Okinawans, if you, they, they investigated that population right after World War II and they were devastated and being occupied by American forces. Is that a fair snapshot of that diet? Not really, you know, that was also known as the island of lard or the island of pig lard or something. So, and the Blue Zones came out in a book without any footnotes. So there's no way to validate any of any of that research. Yeah, the Eat Lancet study is, uh, is its whole own topic, but it is, um, it was did not cite any clinical trials. Um, and and when analyzed, it was highly deficient in many nutrients, any diet that does not provide the nutrients that you need for life health and life is a diet that cannot be considered ideal or even adequate for human functioning. So the Eat Lancet was the product of a, a real um, effort to try to create a diet for climate change, um, but not for human health. It's really not a diet about human health. If you look for, again, the clinical trials, grade A quality data that can show cause and effect. If you look for that data on vegan, the vegan diet, uh, what you find is almost nothing, like very few studies. And in many of the studies that are most often cited, studies by Neil Barnard, studies by John McDougall, the very you know, well-known vegans, those studies do not show benefit from their diet. Or in the one by um, Esselton, that was had no control group. That's not a proper trial. So, you know, there's a there's a lot of holes in that literature. Or um, and you know, when you compare that to the clinical trial literature on the low carb diet, right? That's over a thousand clinical trials now have been done on on the low carb approach. So there's really just no comparison in terms of the evidence base. So I'm afraid, you know, that veganism, although many people feel very committed to it, it just doesn't have the evidence to support it, either historically or in the scientific literature. Yeah. Well, nice. Well, thank you for that. I'm sorry to, to ambush you with this, such a such a long question. Okay. Right there. <laughs> um, but yeah. So are are you low carb yourself, or what? What do you do? You do keto or carnivore, or what is your your go to? After all, um, you know, I do not have like a rigorous <laughs> diet. I am basically low carb, mm -hmm. and um, most of the time. But I'm not. Um, I'm not like a perfect adherer to that. Yeah. diet i have to say so yeah. well, that's all right you know i sometimes have chocolate i <laughs> sometimes have things that i really yeah. like crackers i mean i'm you know i'm just not perfect <laughs> well, but good. um but um but yeah i'm basically i'm much more low carb than when i was a vegetarian i'm much more low carb than when i used to suffer you know chronic sinus infections you know my health has improved enormously um and uh, and so, you know, I, by, by any normal person's standards, I'm, I'm low carb. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time out. I know we've, um, uh, been talking for a while and I really, really appreciate you taking the time out. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I think very, very informative, uh, for me and, and I think everyone watching. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. It's great to talk to you. And I really appreciate you having me on your show too. All right. We'll see you soon.